Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Billy Teshik, the president of National Association of Women in Construction, NEWIC, in Qatar. I hope you and your dear ones are safe and well. On behalf of the NEWIC Qatar Foundation Board, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening for the NEWIC Qatar Tech Series webinar on challenges ahead in construction and available tools. I would also like to extend a warm, warm welcome to our partners and sponsors for joining us. Qatar University, Public Works Authority Ashkal, GHD, Parsons, GSonic, Erga, Turner & Townsend, Qatar Financial Center, Lean Construction Institute Qatar, DMG, the Big Five Construct Qatar, and TMF. Before we start, I'd like to note a few points. The session is being recorded and will be available with a copy of the presentation slides next week. To receive your electronic attendance certificate, you are required to attend the presentation at, for at least 90%. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box. I'll bring them up during the presentation when possible and um, um, if it's appropriate to uh, interrupt the flow of presentation. If not, we, we, we will anyway have this uh, session of questions and answers after the presentations. Also, if we don't cover all the questions uh, uh, this evening, uh, we, will, uh, we will post the answers uh, next week with the slides and, and, the, um, and the recording of the webinar. So, um, we expect the webinar to last for one and a half hour, including Q&A session. Uh, your microphone, please, should be muted and your camera turned off at all times. We appreciate your full attention during the webinar. So please, uh, during this time, stay away from distractions. After the webinar, please submit your feedback. Uh, you can do that actually during the webinar as well in the chat box where you will be putting questions. Uh, what we would like you to do, uh, put the pl uh, plus for positive, uh, positive um, feedback and delta sign for any improvements that you, that you may uh, suggest so we can continuously improve our presentations. Now we got to the most important part. Let me introduce you our presenter for this evening, James Bannon, construction and computer scientist. James is a maker, a creator and an innovator. He started his journey as a tech entrepreneur in Texas A&M dorm room in 2001 and has had a wild ride of challenges and successes ever since in the construction and technology domain. James and his amazing team and JB Knowledge uh, have built and recently sold their software product company Smartbid in a groundbreaking deal in 2018. JB Knowledge currently has 200 employees in the USA, Argentina and South Africa and is a leading provider of technology products and services for insurance and construction. Based in College Station, Texas, James has served two terms on the College Station City Council and has served for five years as an adjunct professor of construction science at Texas A&M. Aside from his work, James and his wife have two daughters. He says living with the three girls now more than ever makes him aware of gender equity. He's also a pilot with a passion for aviation and flies himself to his meetings. He also plays the guitar and the piano. James's philosophy to fellow entrepreneurs is to build self-funded businesses that are financially sustain sustainable and growth oriented. And uh, an ide ideology that was passed to him, down to him from his entrepreneur father. As the CEO of, of JB Knowledge, James continues to innovate tech for the insurance and construction industries. You may have heard uh, him sharing his wisdom and insights as the host of his popular weekly podcasts, The Contact Crew and The Insure Tech Geek, or in one of over 400 conferences he has spoken at in the last 15 years. 
James will take us through his presentation on challenges ahead in construction and available tools. James, over to you. Awesome, thank you, Billy, appreciate it. Uh, it's so good to see everybody today. Um, I'm excited to talk with you about uh, technology topics. Um, yes, and you can see my screen, of course, you can ask questions through GoToWebinar. There's a little questions box. You can fill your questions out and you can ask them there. So feel free to do that. And um, let's uh, let's get started. Let's have some fun geeking out on this. Again, um, my name is James. Uh, feel free to hit me up on email. Um, you can uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, my website, jamesbenham.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm on pretty much every social media channel you can find. And uh, I'd be happy to engage with you afterwards. If you have specific questions, comments, concerns, uh, things you want to talk about in, in regards to technology. I am a Texas A&M graduate. Uh, I, I know that we have a special connection with Qatar through the Texas A&M University branch campus there. I got two degrees at Texas A&M and I just finished a five-year appointment in construction science there. So I'm a very, very passionate Texas Aggie. I am really excited about the partnership Texas A&M has with Qatar. I've had many friends that have gone over there and worked and, and loved being there. So I've never been there. So this is very special to me today to get to speak with you and to get to talk about my favorite topic, which is technology. I, I absolutely love uh, talking about tech. I've been, um, my parents were not really into technology. <laughs> That's an understatement. When I was growing up and I'm 40 years old, so uh, 1979 to 1992, we had no computing devices in the house. We had one television with antenna and a, and a wired telephone. That was my majority of my childhood. And then when I was 12, my dad went and got a magical thing called a computer and my entire life changed. And I realized that you could, you could do just about anything with computing. And it, it got me really, really excited. And uh, ever since then, uh, for the last really 28 years, I have uh, dedicated my life to building technology, getting other people uh, to use technology and to uh, transforming industries and companies with it. It's really an amazing calling for me. I wanna, I wanna go through some phrases I'd like to not use today. <laughs> I'm gonna mention it just now because I really, really don't wanna use these phrases. Um, the new normal. Can we not say this? Uh, you know, they, now maybe maybe this is just in the United States. Maybe these phrases aren't being used elsewhere. Uh, but you know, I I kind of believe that we wake up to a new normal every day, no matter what's going on in the world. So let's not use this phrase. Extraordinary times. Uh, I think that most times are extraordinary. Uh, my uh, my grandmother uh, lived through the the last big pandemic uh, in 1919. Those were really extraordinary times. Her father passed away from the flu in that epidemic. And th there's all kinds of things that happen. You know, we, ha we have all kinds of events in the world that make almost every year extraordinary. So let's just, let's just assume that there are extraordinary things that constantly happen, both positive and negative. Social distancing. Why did we pick a phrase we've never used? This is something that I find interesting. Why couldn't we have just said, stay two meters away from everybody? <laughs> and then uncertain times. Uh, when have we ever had certainty? I mean, let's be honest. When have we ever had certainty in business or life or bi or or anything in construction? This is a highly uncertain industry. So let's just let's just try and not use these phrases today. Let's talk about let's talk about technology. I do want to talk about endurance just a little bit because I think it's important that when you look at technology, you have the right perspective. Um. In fact, when you look at any any life event, you have the right perspective. Uh, there was a, a U.S. Navy Admiral, James Stockdale, who was imprisoned in Vietnam for many years, and he was in a pretty bad place. Many of the people that he was with uh, died in prison, and uh, it was tough. And, and he said, you must never confuse the faith that you will prevail in the end with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality. So as we look at a difficult economy and we look at uh, a very strange new set of circumstances we operate in, one thing that's frustrating many people in business and in regards to technology, by the way, is that they don't know the end date. You know, in construction, we... 
we exist on deadlines. Now, unfortunately, we all too often, more than 50% of the time, miss these deadlines. Um, but, but this is tough for a project-based industry to wrap their brain around, that we don't know exactly when the end date is. And so I just want to I just want to mention this that that it's important to have faith that this particular phase this coronavirus uh, phase is going to end we just don't know when and so um, it also presents a really great opportunity to do things that we never might have had the time to do before um, like for example I picked up some new hobbies I worked on exercise or all kinds of things that this presented as an opportunity. And uh, I have not beleaguered myself with the mandate to set an end date. There's no point in setting a date, Dan, because we don't know. But what we do know is that it will end. Far worse pandemics have ended without the medical technology we have today. We have far, far better medical technology than 100 years ago. So let's have faith that this will end uh, without setting an irrational deadline that none of us can control. And then let's also take this time maybe it's downtime or maybe it's slower time to really work on operational efficiency and improvement. It's a really great time to work on tech. Now let's talk about digital disruption. Uh, now these are a lot of US brands, but they ended up being global brands. And so they may or may not resonate with you. But these are brands that were very, very, very big parts of the, uh, the economy here that are no longer part of the economy here. I mean, Kodak, that was a global brand for photographs. If it was pictures, it was Kodak. Uh, now we take more pictures than we've ever taken in the history of humanity. We take more pictures, more videos, more content. We just don't do it with Kodak. We watch more video content, whether it's on YouTube or whether it's on Netflix or whether it's on any one of the streaming services that you have. We just don't rent movies at video stores anymore. We listen to more music than we've ever listened to. We just don't buy CDs. You see, industries persist. It's individual companies that end up getting disrupted. And that's really where we have to factor in what disruption is and what it does. Disruption is a business model change where segments of an industry cannot adapt. The industry continues, construction will continue. People will keep building things. It's just whether or not they'll build them with your companies is the real question. Companies in this particular moment in time that did not adopt technology are having a far more difficult time surviving than those who did. This is a moment of disruption. Now we have digital disruption, but you also have outside factor disruption like what's going on right now. And there will be many companies that will not survive this because they were poorly equipped, they were ill-equipped, they had terrible finances or they had borderline finances and they had very little digi digitization, they had very little digital tools. And so they they will struggle to, su to survive this time. Many will fail. That's another type of disruption, but many will survive and will grow and will explode after this because they'll have more opportunities because there's less competition. So disruption occurs constantly. We have to be aware that we can be agents of change or we can be the receivers of change. And generally being the receiver of change means you get either drastically reduced in size or put out of business. There's only one blockbuster left in the United States that rents videos. There used to be thousands. People still watch video content, just not with them. So non-digital, I just mentioned this, non-digital construction uh, companies have not fared as well in the current situation. Why? Well, working remotely is a lot harder when all of your tools are on premise. Uh, if all of your stuff's in paper, then it presents a really big challenge. Now, a good 10% of construction companies that we work with, either as advisors or consultants, remember, um, my company, JB Knowledge, we have uh, 212 employees between the United States, Argentina, and South Africa. Uh, we build both product and custom services for construction companies. So we write custom software, we do advisory services with them, and then we have product. And, and so I've gotten to work with people all over the world and build the software for them and to see how they've done and observe how they're doing now. And I can tell you the ones that resisted change, about 10% of construction companies were digital, meaning they, they made a concerted effort to really remove paper from the process and to go cloud-based and remove on-premise computing. Those 10% are doing far, far better right now, financially and operationally than the rest.
uh, it turns out being operationally efficient also makes you very resilient as a company. I also like Bill Gibson's quote, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. A lot of the technology, all the technology I'm gonna talk about today is already here, it's just not necessarily here in your company. You know, there's a, I was watching some videos out of Australia today from Fastbrick, Fastbrick Robotics, and we'll talk about them later, recently doubled the speed of their Hadrian X um, block and brick laying robot. Their goal is a thousand an hour. I mean, they, 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 the, pr the production numbers they're talking about for on-site robotic bricklaying are crazy. I, I would not have seen that level of automation coming this quickly, but it's here. It's just not everywhere. So the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And I'd say that construction companies are faced with a bunch of simultaneous challenges right now. Number one, working remotely. So a lot of folks have had to adopt technology they were resistant to or fighting or just said, I'll never do that. They've had to start doing it. That's a really big deal. The, the whole world using GoToMeeting or Zoom or WebEx, whatever remote meeting tool they want to, and many people re re resisted that. They, in general, many companies resisted working remotely because they just simply don't believe people can be productive from home. Number two, keeping on-site workers safe. I mean, there's a really big challenge right now with keeping people safe on the job site. There's a lot of technology to help with that. Number three, cash flow. When uh, receivables balances get stretched out, construction companies already don't get paid on time. You stretch it out even farther and many of them break. And number four, keeping data secure. And I wanna start with data security because this is important when we're having a technology topic. And this is, this is the same thing globally, right? Anybody in the world gets hit with this. When you're having a technology topic, you have to talk about data security because data security is a really big deal, right? It's a really big deal um, how to secure all the things that you are going to build. So let's let's just talk about what people are doing, what's going on right now in data security as people go virtual, um, protecting contractor office systems during remote work. That's a really big deal. As uh, crisis work and hacking is increasing, in other words, we've seen a dramatic increase in our construction companies getting hit with hacking attacks during coronavirus because now they have remote workers and they uh, are attacking that particular vulnerability because they weren't necessarily secured and set up to go. Also seen a, a ramp up in state-sponsored uh, coronavirus hacking attacks. In other words, uh, entire countries, governments are sponsoring and promoting um, these type of exploitations. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on in IT. So while we talk about everything today, whether it's web-based app or mobile apps or um, BIM and automation there, or w whatever we're gonna talk about robotics, remember that data security has to always be kept at the top of your mind in particular when there's such a large ramp up in security attacks. So with that, and again, this is not, I do a whole, <laughs> I do a whole separate talk on data security. It's an hour and a half. We're not gonna do that today. I'm just, I just wanted to mention at the beginning that I recognize there's a lot of considerations to factor in and that it's not all a rose filled garden here, right? There's some negative consequences of going entirely digital that we have to deal with. We still live in abundant times. We're, despite everything going on, we still live in abundant times. When you compare modern society to 150 or 200 years ago, we have a drastically better life. And when you're looking at technology adoption, I think it's important you remember this because if you forget that we live in abundant times and you'll buy into the negative thinking that, that um, really is pervasive in uh, news media, around, you know, everything's worse than it used to be. Um, the time of our parents and grandparents was better, right? There was this golden era of civilization that's not now, that was in the past. We don't know when, but we know that somehow we think it was better. And so I think it's important to look at the data. 200 years ago, exactly 200 years ago, 90% of the world lived in poverty. It's less than a dollar a day. Now that's
difference. It used to be lethal to give birth. I mean, you're talking about really high maternal mortality rates just 120 years ago, and now it's now it's plummeted. It's like less than one percent. It's, it's a fraction of a percent. It's far safer to give birth. I mean, there's average life expectancy has doubled, doubled in the last 200 years. And then when you really dive into technology, that's really technology is driving a lot of these changes. I mean, for example, deaths from natural disasters, floods, uh, hurricanes, etc., have have really come almost down to almost zero. There's a there's a graph that Peter Mondiamantis does where we we have very 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 few largely because we launch satellites into space that are constantly monitoring the earth's weather system so now we know when they're coming you know 100 years ago you had no idea a hurricane was coming or a cyclone was coming or you had i mean you had no idea so technology has played a pivotal role in dramatically Im improving the human condition it's also played a pivotal role in reducing the hours work per person so your grandparents on average worked double the number of hours per week that you do and, it, that, and that's something that's really interesting to look at the number of days per week they worked, which was a six day work week, and how many hours per week they worked. Uh, it was dramatically higher. And at the same time, you have technology radically transforming the world. You have the cost of technology dramatically dropping. 1999, on the verge of a new millennia, this is wild, it was $1,245 per gigabit per second for bandwidth and now it's under 10 bucks computing cost performance dollars per million transistors was 200 bucks in 1992 now it's six cents in 2012 now it's way less than that storage costs 1992 a gig of storage was 500 dollars. now it's functionally zero because it's less than a penny you see technology keeps getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and more and more available and what's happening is people are working less per week production rates are going up in every other industry except construction, by the way. And so there, there's all kinds of interesting things going on that I think it's important that we acknowledge. It's also important to understand that we have to go digital, not just paperless. What does that mean? Well, going paperless largely means scanning in the paper you already have and routing it around like you would your paper. It, it's a very primitive way of getting rid of paper because you're not actually digitizing the process. Digitizing the process would involve rethinking how you're collecting the data, rethinking how you're routing it, and then rethinking how you process it. Going paperless really means, hey, I'm going to take the paper we have, I'm just going to scan that in, and we're going to route around a, an image. So you don't have all the structured data, and you're not really rethinking your process. Now, it is more efficient. I mean, I'll give you that. It's more efficient but it's nowhere near as effective achieving the desire. Outcome as going digital. So I want you to distinguish going digital, going paperless. Going paperless is great. It's good baby stuff going paperless, but collecting it digitally routing it digitally, processing it digitally, and transforming your collection process and that are really competing. Uh, there's, there's some big groups. Yeah. We're going. And the, uh, the, the two, Procore and Autodesk on a global scale, duking it out, for domination around um, the di a digital platform. I'm just making sure you guys can still hear me okay. I just got noticed that the uh, internet connection may not be fantastic. So if you can just chat with me, uh, Billy, if you just want to chat back and just make sure that everybody can still hear me. Uh, so um, let's, uh, let's keep going. Autodesk and Procore are duking it out for digital supremacy and helping people go digital. So it's a really, really, really big battle. And they're, they're creating these comprehensive project platforms for digitization, where you can collect your data digitally, store it, process it, and route it. These are really the two biggest groups in the world. I mean, they're, they're you know, uh, Procore does uh, $280 million a year in revenue. Autodesk does billions. And uh, they're, they're going at it head to head uh, globally for all of your business. They, they want it all. 
there's some other really interesting players in in a niche space that are also doing some interesting things around digitization. And one of those is Dato. And, and I, I'm going to talk about a lot of different technology products today because I want you to understand the the breadth and depth of solutions that are available to you. And I, I like to talk about what problem they solve. You see, Procore and Autodesk solve a big problem, and that is how do I manage RFIs, punch list plans, my jobs, my schedules? How do I manage all of this in one place, connect it together and get everybody on the same page at the same time? How do I how do I do something really simple? How do I keep everybody in the same revision set of plans at the same time? That's a big problem too, right? I mean, people on, on job sites build from different sets, different revisions of plans all the time, and it creates all kinds of problems and mistakes. So that's the big problem they solve, one of them. It, it, then, then you look at the other, one of the other really big problems in going digital is how do you find your information? In a paper-based world, um, when you're working remotely, uh, it creates a huge problem. But let's say you're all in an office together. You can have little cubbies or shelves where all the plans are. You can have a plan room. Um, you can have your specs and your plans on different folders and files together. That's fine. Um, but how do you, when you go digital, find all of your information? What if you use five different apps? What if you use Procore and Bluebeam? And what if you use Revit? And then you also happen to use PlanGrid. <laughs> I mean... What if you have some files over in Dropbox and Ignite, and maybe you have something in OneDrive because you use Office 365? That, that, this is not an uncommon fragmentation of digital information. Where's your search engine to find all that information? Well, there's some really good ones coming out, and Dato is one of them. Another one that's uh, coming out as well is called Brick, B-R-I-Q. Um, they both connect into all of your different data sources and allow you to use natural language search to search through all of your documents, records, files, plans, specs, et cetera. It's all, it's all in one search engine. And so it indexes across all of your platform and gives you, and you can even do voice powered search as well, where we can just speak the question and it finds the documents. And so going digital means also having a really efficient, effective way to to find the information you're going to collect uh, dato and brick are, are two of those solutions that help you do that i want to remind you too you can uh efficiently stink at what you're doing you can efficiently be really terrible <laughs> um, so when you're looking at adopting technology and we'll talk about a bunch more tools today remember that you have to achieve both efficiency and effectiveness effectiveness is achieving the desired outcome Efficiency is doing so in the least number of steps. So if you have a really bad, bad, bad process and you apply technology to a bad process, you can actually accelerate how bad that process is and lose even more money. So just keep that in mind. This is another really interesting technology I've run across out of Australia that um, looked at Procore because Procore has a web form. And even, even when you go digital, there's opportunities to make things even more efficient and effective. Um, this is Nifty AI. It uses an AI-based chat bot that allows you to enter your reports uh, every day. So you can see it texts you and says, hey, what'd you do today? And then you said, hey, we had two guys for three hours this morning, five guys for eight hours, and one guy for two hours this afternoon, all doing first fix on level one. And then it takes that information and parses the text into a form and then fills it out inside Procore for you. So there's some really interesting ways, and we've seen this to be really effective globally, to use text messaging to collect information from people, whether it's daily reports or job logs, daily logs, um, RFIs, punch lists. There's some really, really neat technologies coming out that allow you to, to use something that's really universal, and that's a text message. There's also some really exciting technology coming around, drawing and, and generating. So I don't know the mix up of the people that are on this webinar right now. I don't know if you're a field engineer or a project manager, or I don't know what you do. But there, there's a very, very fundamental thing to construction called drawing what we're gonna build before we build it. <laughs> uh, when I was 14, I started my very first CAD class. And I remember having to, well, it was actually not on CAD. It was just a, it wasn't computer-aided drawing. It was just called drafting. And we had drafting tables and we had 
uh, you know, we had rulers and pencils and we, we, protractors and we learned how to draft plans and we had a blueprint machine that was literally a blueprint machine. This is a very, obviously a very tedious process, but then, then we adopted CAD and really didn't reshape what we were thinking about. And so we simply went paperless with that process of drawing two-dimensional plans. Instead of using pencil and paper, we started using a computer and thus became computer-aided drafting. But some other industries recognized how inefficient it was to draw every line. I want you to think about what industry used to draw everything and now does not draw hardly anything by hand. And it's the entertainment entertainment industry, the animated movie. And, and the company that has really pioneered this has been Pixar, which of course is now owned by Disney. Pixar went out and said, you know, it's ridiculous that we draw these frames. If you don't know how animation works, there's, a, you know, between 24 and 30 frames of drawing for every second of animation. So if you have a 30 second animation, just 30 seconds, that can be up to 900 independent drawings. You can imagine how inefficient this is. It takes forever to draft an animation because you're just drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing. It's like an old flip book. You used to have flip books when you were a kid. So there's a way to use technology. There's a way to leverage technology to do the drafting for you so that you really become, uh, and this is why, uh, in my introduction, you heard me refer to as a construction and computer scientist. The fields of construction science and computer science are merging because we're actually writing software that designs buildings and then software that operates those buildings. And now we're even with the Hadrian X, you'll see that later writing software that does the actual building too. So this, this field of computational science is being merged with construction science in a really fascinating way. Um, and it really mimics what has happened already in the animation and entertainment industry. And it's, it, it closely tracks with this concept called digital twins. Uh, and this is a recent article from a couple of weeks ago. And, and I love Clifton Harness's quote. He said, because we have software that can model in insane detail every bit and piece of a building, you can now have a digital copy of that building. It enables the owner of the building to do things in the model you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. You can have a digital twin of all the hotels the Army Corps of Engineers are trying to convert into hospitals. You know, one of the really big problems is when we complete a building, we don't have a great digital copy or record of what exactly was built. Our as-builts are terrible in general in construction. And so there's a lot of technology that allows us to really generate every detail that will be in a building and then to verify it was put in and update the model later with what was actually installed so you have a really you know 100 accurate as built so let's let's look at some of the technology i mean there's really great tools like grasshopper dynamo flux bentley um, that have done some really really great things around this space and i'm just showing a video really quick on automating rebar design in revit using dynamo so if you use revit and you're hand drawing everything in revit this is really not the fastest way to get repetitive tasks done. I want you to think about all the things that are drawn in Revit or in CAD that are, that are repetitive items that are drawn over and over and over and over and over again on job after job after job after job after job. There's a lot of them, right? Rebar is one of them. So what you have here is an example with uh, Dynamo on the right, looks like a plate of spaghetti, and the actual Revit view on the left. This is showing you how you can this is this is a, a visual programming language, by the way. It's a node-based programming language, so it's a little different than just writing lines of code. And it allows you to write software that draws the rebar, which means the next project you have, instead of starting from scratch with that software program, you can actually go in and copy and paste and use that again and modify it for whatever's different about the next project. This is exactly what Pixar does. If you saw Toy Story, 25 years ago, it used technology that was upgraded every single movie they did. So when they when they were finding Nemo, which was all about a fish and water, they had to really improve the way water rendered in 3D. And so they then have used that water 
in all of their movies since. So your library of programs builds on itself, whether it's rebar design or designing bathrooms. You know, those are so repetitive. And yet we treat them like brand new projects every time we design them. So there's a lot of ways to get around hand drawing everything. You know, El Philharmonie, a, a really brilliant music hall. I do, I like to play the guitar and the piano. I, I, I music's in my, my life every day. There's nothing better than an acoustically perfect ceiling, but to get that, you have to have a computer design the ceiling panels <laughs> to reflect and refract that music uh, into the right place. It is very hard to do with a hand designed ceiling panels. And so they actually use com a computer generated design to design all 10,000 ceiling panels and then to assemble them by letters and numbers. So they, they really did some amazing work. And of course the, it yielded an acoustically perfect building. That the same guy that I talked about in the quote of the article earlier has built test fit. This is revolutionizing architecture. If you're in, if you're in site planning, if that's something you do, again, I don't know what your individual job titles are, but if you are involved in site planning, you know that when you look at a site, you're trying to fill out what the highest and best use for that site is and how you can get the, the highest yield out of that acreage and out of the restrictions that that municipality or that country places on what you're allowed to build there. And so this is a really neat tool that was that really demonstrates this, comp this concept of computational and generative design. It allows you to define what unit types you're, you want to build, right? Let's say it's multifamily. So you're trying to, to build a multifamily complex and you want a certain mix of different unit types. You can tell it the mix you want and then you can draw you can draw the size of the lot you have and then the beautiful thing is it can automatically generate the optimal um, utilization the optimal density of units inside of that space you can automatically generate parking just by clicking and dragging on the parking lot you can even tell it they just rolled out yesterday the ability to put trees in the parking lot that might not be as big of a thing in Qatar but it's a big deal here they're required to do it um, and, and so you, you can actually say, I have to have this many trees in the parking lot. It'll automatically generate those as well. And so all these things that, that we pay architecture firms hundreds or thousands of hours to run through different permutations of plans can all be done in a matter of seconds now in this concept of computational and generative design. Another really interesting topic to talk about is tracking people and property for protection and productivity. Yeah, you know, I told you one of the big things that contractors are having to deal with right now is keeping workers safe. Now we've always had to work about worry about keeping workers safe, but we weren't worried about them spreading a virus on the on the job site. We were worried about them getting hit by something or having materials dropped on them or them slip tripping or falling. So there's a lot of technology being employed to do contract tra contact tracing, density analysis. There's some really fascinating stuff going out there right now. Um, that's utilizing a combination of cameras, sensors, and data to automatically manage this. Now, now, could you do this manually without a computer? Yes. Hire enough people to watch the job site and you can do just about all of this, but what's your cost going to be to do that and how effective will that be? So quant.ai is a really interesting artificial intelligence software tool that also uses tracking hardware that allows you to do two things I think that are really important and relevant right now. You can actually measure the density of workers in a space and how far apart they are from each other. You can also do contact tracing. So if one of your workers turns up sick and tests positive, you can go back and you can trace who that person was in contact with on the job site so you can notify them that they need to get tested. So there's some really interesting technology coming out using a combination. You'll see these, this sensor in particular is one that uh, can put on your, your belt or on your clothing. It's, it's uh, particularly interesting. That's quant.ai. Gen does another one that does something very similar, measures uh, workers within feet of each other, does a symptoms assessment, does some really interesting th stuff about social distancing. Spotter is one that's been out here in the United States for quite a while that uh, you, know, you put a pager on your worker's uh, belt. And so tracking does not have to be 
putting an app on their phone and tracking where they are all the time. You can use these dedicated sensor solutions. You'll notice that the popular solutions have a dedicated sensor network so that workers can take it off when they leave and have some privacy when they leave the job site. And in this particular solution, it has slip trip fall sensors. So not only can you measure when that worker is around other people and if it's too dense of a worker density in that area, you can also measure if uh, that person slips, trips, or falls, if they have an accident, they can push a button on the on this particular unit, and it'll call the superintendent. So there's some really excellent examples of tracking technologies that are helping us measure production, measure productivity, right? What percentage of time that they're on the site are they working and being productive, and also uh, can help us measure um, and keep them safe. The tool companies aren't being left out of this. Uh, Milwaukee and DeWalt are you know, two major multi-billion dollar tool companies that both have tracking solutions embedded in the power tools. So you can you know, find out where was this tool last seen, where was it placed. Uh, it also allows you to load your profile onto the tool. So if like somebody else uses your impact drill, you can show up and pair it with your phone and load your settings on that impact so it then behaves the way you want it to behave. So you're seeing some really interesting innovation coming from both of these, both around tracking the batteries, tracking the tools, and then uh, tracking how, how much they're used and where. Again, all that drives down to finding things, being productive, um, et cetera. What do you do with the tracking data? You know, like, like just installing a bunch of tracking systems and not doing anything with it doesn't do you much good either, does it? So you've got some really interesting um, utilizations for tracking data. And you'll see on this one, you have a prefab build versus a traditional build. Th this is just demonstrating by using worker tracking. Uh, this demonstrates how much more efficient and effective you can make a job site. And in this case, it's being used to justify prefabrication because there's still a lot of doubters that prefab and offsite construction is really a lot better. And you'll see here in this particular example by tracking worker movement, um, they were able to prove that the workers in this particular case building the exact same thing, they built the same thing. One was built on site, one was built off site with prefab in a prefab facility. They went from 13 miles of walking and 58 hours of work down to 2.8 miles of walking and 18 hours of work. It was about a 70% reduction, 70% reduction in the miles walked and a 70% reduction in the hours worked. It's dramatic, dramatic reduction. And, and, and this is where the story gets compelling when you're talking about going to prefabrication and kitting and uh, modular construction, you know, you have to prove it, you have to prove that it's that much more profitable. And this is where it really comes into play. And, and you can see, even when you're inside prefab, you can optimize your prefab facility. This is from unit number two being prefabbed. This is, these are bathroom units, by the way. Bathroom unit two being prefabbed to bathroom unit number 23. And between those units, they optimize the location of the tools, materials, and storage. And they reduced the number of carpenter hours from 25 hours down to seven. So they had a 70% reduction in time to move to prefab and another 66% reduction in time to optimize prefab, which means they cut 90% of the labor waste out of producing these bathroom units. 90%. Yeah. We're in a low margin business of our own creation, folks. We are. This is a low margin business that we created. We created an environment that likes to build first and ask questions later. We create an environment that likes to, you know, fire before aiming. <laughs> and uh, we can do much better. This is a great example from the US, Faith Technologies. They're a electrical subcontractor. And they were able to show that they, they were about average in 2009. So 11 years ago, they had an average labor productivity rate. The average is about 42%. The average is 37%. They were at 42%. You know, see, they had a ton of waste. 
they had 24% of their time when they put productivity measurement teams out on the job site, they were able to identify 24% of worker time as being waste, meaning they weren't planning to work or working. It was just waste, waiting around, sitting. So huge, and they were able to cut that out pretty quickly. And then what they did is they really, really worked on on, re on reducing secondary waste. You know, that's that's time spent preparing for work, but not actually at the work phase. Primary productivity is the time you spend at the work phase doing work. So you'll see here that primary productivity rate went from 42% to 64% in seven years. Their profit almost doubled by using process and, and technologies that helped them measure productivity and improvement. So really, really awesome stuff. Really, really, really awesome. And um, I just wanted y'all to, to see that there's real money here to be made, but it, it took bold goal setting on behalf of Faith Technologies. They had to set some really audacious goals to try and achieve this. Um, the, the CEO originally set a goal of 30 for 30. Uh, in other words, every tool and material had to be within 30 feet or 30 seconds of the workspace and think about what you have to do to change a job site for that. Now, once they, they hit 30 for 30, so he set a new goal, strive for five, meaning materials have to be within five feet or five seconds of reach. So they spend less time looking for materials. These are real, real problems that drive really massive amounts of waste into the construction process. Imaging and AI are also becoming a big part of our lives. I mentioned it earlier that artificial intelligence is doing things with cameras. Now, when we talk about AI, general artificial intelligence, the ability for a machine to think like, feel like a human being, that's not here yet. Yet, maybe 20 or 30 years, we don't know when that's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen eventually, we believe. Right now though, we are dealing with subsets of artificial intelligence like deep learning. Uh, that's the ability to really have a machine learn specific topics like image recognition. And so you'll see, this is what a machine sees when it looks at a security camera or a, or a crane camera on a job site. It's able now using a subset of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning to identify what is in the image that it's looking at. It can actually start identifying and tagging what's in the image. This is another one um, that another app that's actually being used to track job site social distancing. This is an, another really interesting one. Um, SmartVid.io is using uh, art, art, you know, a form of artificial intelligence to look at photos and look for PPE. So they can identify if the workers have hard hats or gloves, high vis gear, and automatically identify when workers don't have their PPE on. It can also automatically identify if they're holding a hammer. You can see that this is the, a, a screenshot uh, from that software. You can see that, that it identified there's a hammer and there's wood, cement, roof, concrete, and that the worker has no high-vis gear on. So there's some really interesting things by taking um, iPad and iPhone uh, pictures, drone photography, hard hat cameras, and combining them together into one imaging system and then automatically tagging that content and then integrating it with things like Recap 360, BIM 360, Procore. There's also a, a, some other type of imaging being deployed on the job site right now, thermal cameras. Uh, New York City, they've got uh, a company called Brash Concepts that is taking a thermal imaging system and automatically identifying if any worker exceeds 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, on their forehead. Pretty neat technology. You don't have to touch anybody. You don't have to put a thermometer at their forehead. You can just scan them as they walk in and identify who has a fever. This has uh, been pretty helpful. Uh, it can also detect this even when the worker's wearing a mask. There's also a lot of really interesting things in imagery and machine learning going on around inspections. And so um, 360 cameras are proving to be really, really, really useful um, 360 cameras, if, if you don't have one, you should get one. First off, they're pretty cheap. So these are not expensive. I, I thought I had one in my bag. I'm going to try and get out to show you. But 360 cameras, here it is. 
They're not expensive to buy. This one is a couple hundred dollars. It's the Insta 360 One X. It's my favorite 360 camera right now. You can see it has a fisheye lens on both sides and allows you to turn on the camera, hold it above your head and, and do a single button push. And when you do a single button push, it takes images from both sides of the camera at once. And then it merges it together into a unified 360 bubble of where you were standing. So it's an extremely efficient, effective way of capturing job site documentation. Think about the process right now for going and capturing job site documentation. It's a, it's, a, it's really quite difficult because you have to um, take 20 or 30 photographs of, of any given room, right? You go stand in a space and you click, 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 and then where you store it, a 360 camera turns 16 photos into one. Um, but the really neat thing is that when in an era when you don't want everybody walking around the job site, 360 cameras are providing technology that actually allows workers to walk through a job site with a because it has a video mode. You can turn it on video and just hold and put it on a on a tripod and walk around with it over your head, and then everyone else remotely can log in once that's uploaded and do the exact same job walk and do QAQC and safety inspections remotely. It's, it's really quite compelling what can be done with 360 photos and videos. You can even do production tracking. Now this is, this is the example I wanted to show you of Struction Site where they're actually uh, holding it above their head, turning it in video mode. Um, this now tracks uh, production rates. So only, only on, uh, framing and sheetrock for now. Uh, so it's really particularly useful for commercial construction, but it does measure production rates and allow you to track um, what's being installed and what percentage, you know, it, it's, it's not it's not gonna measure productivity, but it is gonna measure pr production, which is a really useful uh, tool. This is another one, Open Space AI. This is doing something similar uh, it's stitching together all the different 360s that you take so that um, you can compare, this is pretty wild, you can compare the photos you took with the Revit model of that day and it automatically pairs them up. So you can do real-time QAQC and you can see what was put in versus what was supposed to be put in. So from your desktop, you can have just one person walk around the job site. Everyone can log in and do QAQC of the model versus the as the as you know built building, and compare them and see if what is being put in is being put in in the right place. Let's keep going. Remote training and review with apps and VR. This is another area that's that's really particularly interesting. I. I have the Oculus Quest, which is the device on the left. Uh, I, I love it. It's a really, really great virtual reality system. Has proven quite useful for me. Uh, love this. Love this particular device. On the right is the new HTC Vive. Both of these are really great VR systems, and VR has really come into its own. Uh, there's groups like MindForge that are doing uh, like like signal operator training inside VR using their hands so they can learn all the hand signals and they can learn what they're supposed to do. They can simulate, they can simulate any type of situation. It's been, it's been interesting to see the rise of simulators. Um, you know, I'm a pilot and insurance companies now are requiring simulator training for pilots. And they're actually getting to the point where they're not accepting uh, live training as transition training to move to a bigger, uh, a, a bigger plane. In other words, they're recognizing that in a simulator, in particular in, in, a, in, a, in a live simulator with, with you know, VR, you can simulate any type of negative experience and provide a much higher training value add than someone actually going and flying a plane. They're finding the same thing with things like crane operators because you can signal all kind, you can simulate all kinds of terrible situations you would never want to do in training and teach them how to deal with it. And so that you're seeing that come out in VR 
Um, the same company, MindForge, is rolling out some really uh, neat programs for contactless orientation. So when you have new workers, you can do training and orientation through their technology instead of in person, which is also proving to be quite useful and quite relevant. This is another type of VR that's being used called immersive hybrid reality, where a 3D scanner or sensor is put on the front of the VR headset so that the uh, the user can scan their helmet or their hands into the VR simulation. You can see they're training the work on how to operate at high altitudes um, on a beam, and this is a much safer place to do it. And, and, and meetings, right? Like we've been trying to restrict meetings um, and who's in a room and how dense the room is and how many people are there. This is a really interesting technology that I've been using for quite some time now. Um, it's really, 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 really neat. Uh, it allows up to 12 people from anywhere in the world to jump into the same uh, BIM model and review it, annotate it. Uh, you can see there's two in the same room here, but you can have people from all over the world logged in and collaborate on models and do a virtual job walk and punch list, um, which is re really neat and can save a boatload of time, in particular when you're in the design and review phase of construction. You can also dramatically reduce human contact, and that's another goal with robotics. Now, the, some of these are really, really neat. Doxel um, solves a big problem. You can fly a drone to use photogrammetry. That's Photogrammetry is the process of converting images into data points. But it's, it's pretty challenging to fly a drone inside. And I know because I've tried, I'm a commercial drone pilot and I've attempted to, and, and I've been mostly successful, but it's pretty, pretty difficult flying. So this is a tracked drone that'll follow the same path every day and measure production rates, that's it. So you can see the production rate and it's measuring the actual versus targeted so you can see if you're on target or not for production rates. And now they've really focused this on mechanical electrical plumbing and they've paired the tracked drone with a laser scanner. Uh, they're also using it for QAQC so if you can see if things are being installed out of tolerance, uh, all with a drone instead of a human. You know, in, in the past, a human would have manually uh, done QAQC. In the recent past, a human would have moved a laser scanner around. Now you can actually train the robot to drive the scanner for you. Not with a remote control. We're talking about an autonomous robot. You, you show it the path once and it follows it and does collision avoidance. Uh, the folks at Boston Dynamics have now uh, a week ago made this for available for sale at $74,500 for this uh, robotic dog. It can climb stairs, climb hills, avoid obstacles, walk around things that are in its path. You can have a, an attachment that goes on top of its head that allows it to open doors. Um, and what's going on is uh, large firms like Hensel Phelps are putting laser scanners on top of this and using Spot to walk the job site every day and laser scan the entire job site. So they have daily as-builts. And that's really the world we're approaching is a world where we have daily production rate tracking, daily as builts, and the ability to wind back to any point in time and review what happened then. Um, you know, along with all this computer imaging and sensor technology, you're now not just allowing for people to have self-driving cars, which I know have to fascinate you. They fascinate me that that a Tesla and I drove a Tesla Model Three the other day and was just absolutely awe inspired at how good its autopilot functionality was. I mean, it was ridiculously good at autopilot. Uh, this is Builter, who is taking traditional heavy construction equipment and not controlling it with a remote control, but loading all the cut and fill instructions and the the equipment, which is stored in that container on top of the ceiling that you saw, is doing all the cut and fill on its own. It made the decision and it, it runs itself. And, and it, again, I, I briefly mentioned drones. You can see how material piles, if you have to measure material piles, this is a big problem and you can, you can have a lot of waste due to uh, improper material pile measurement. You can see here that uh, instead of that guy climbing 
the material pile with a stick, you can now launch a drone in a matter of two minutes, can fly the site, capture the data, upload it, and then do all of his, his volumetric assessment of material piles. I've done this with my own drone. I use a DJI Phantom 4 Pro, and uh, I use Drone Deploy which will allow for volumetric calculation. So I can measure the volume of material piles and how much they change day to day. You have robots busy laying bricks at Auburn University. This, this is Sam the bricklaying robot, lays entire walls of bricks. Tiebot in the top right was invented by a highway contractor, again, trying to drive the efficiency. Also, he could not find, I interviewed him on the podcast. This would be a really good one to go and listen to on the Contact Group podcast. Uh, interviewed him and, and he just it is back breaking work to tie a rebar and he could not get enough workers and so he invented a robot that um he he invented a robot that would identify using computer vision where the intersection of two pieces of rebar is and it would drop down and tie the rebar uh, it sells for eight hundred thousand dollars you can also lease it per project it's, it, and, it, and it works, he uses it on all of his bridge jobs. The Chinese have been pioneering uh, 3D printing for some time now. You're starting to see a lot of other companies uh, take this up. Certainly Contour Crafting has done a pretty incredible job um, of producing a, a home in about two and a half hours. So there's some pretty, pretty awesome stuff that they're doing there. Um, around around home printing um and then you know the the spanish as well that you, you've seen um that that uh, this this is a bridge that that was 3d printed out of concrete as well here we go just make sure the screen is sharing okay should be i know the videos probably aren't really smooth so uh, you, can, you can get the general gist for how this is working again feel free to ask any questions in the questions panel on the uh, on the webinar there uh, this is version one of fast brick out of australia uh, it uses a specialized concrete block not a standard cmu and it uses an adhesive instead of mortar and uh, they went from 85 bricks um, previously to 200 bricks uh, an hour. I mean, they, just the, the numbers are astonishing. Their goal is to do a thousand an hour. I mean, they they want to build a they want to build a print a building level by level, the same way that a 3D printer works um, on the site. So it's a it's a mobile printing unit that can print walls and floors. And they actually print because it's so accurate. They don't have to place the windows and doors beforehand. They go in and install those after all the walls and structures are built. And you can see that it, it glues and sprays a adhesive and glues these in. So that's, this is version one. Version two is now out. Uh, it can also print curved walls. Uh, that was a, a video that was just released this week. They, they can now do curved walls. They can do patterns. They can do all kinds of, of fascinating things with the Hadrian X robot by Fastbrick. So you're seeing this is the culmination of all the technologies we talked about, machine learning, computer vision, 3D printing, uh, cloud connectivity, uh, Revit and BIM, design automation. It's, it, it's like they're, they, it literally leverages everything we talked about today to completely change the way that these buildings are built. And you can see they're going and putting, uh, installing the windows and the doors. We've also seen some really great innovation out of simpler robotics uh, that deliver some drastic returns. This is the really neat uh, tech called Tiger Stop. One of the big problems when you're cutting pipe, if you haven't dealt with a prefab facility that has to cut pipe, is you end up with a lot of copper waste because you don't op the pipe you need with the pipe you have. <laughs> and so what this allows you to do is tell the system the pipe that you need and the pipe you have, it'll pick the, the pipe, you tell it which pipe you, what you have, it'll cut the optimal cuts to reduce waste. So it'll say, okay, I've got a, I've got a 10 meter pipe and I need to have three, three nine meters, you know, three three meter sections 
so it'll pick the right size pipe, perform all the cuts in an optimized fashion. And uh, the, <clears throat> the client buyers that are using Tiger Stop say they went from a giant bucket of waste every day to a very tiny bucket. So they, they had about a 90 to 95% reduction in copper waste by using this and a much faster production. Um, this particular company, UMC, University of Mechanical, went from eight hours a day of running pipe cutting to, to about two. So it was a 75% reduction in time. <clears throat> Their copper PVC cutting went from 150 feet an hour to 750 feet an hour of production. The numbers are crazy. And this is a combination of both Stratus, a software product, and Tiger Stop, a hardware product. And you know, Apiscore is 3D printing in Russia. This is $10,134, all in 3D printed in the middle of winter in Russia. So there's there's some really neat things going on in the area of 3D printing. So what what can you do? Because we're gonna we're gonna jump in to Q and A. I, I wanted to leave some good time for Q and A. And again, feel free to ask questions around this topic. Where do you start? I mean, I think first history favors the prepared. That you've got to remember that being prepared, technologically speaking, means being aggressive about tech adoption personally and professionally beyond the systems that are digital, not just um, pursuing automation wherever possible. Not because you want to eliminate people, but because you want to augment their ability to get things done. We have a massive global worker shortage of skilled laborers. And, and it's really, in the United States, it's, it's pretty intimidating. We have like three workers retiring for every one entering the workforce. We don't have enough skilled labor. And so we very, very much need an easy way of increasing output per person. So we're not trying to eliminate people. We're just trying to keep up with demand. History favors the prepared. The companies that went digital have fared far better in a world that everyone has to be remote. Being innovative, not a naysayer. It is so easy to be critical of technology. It's so easy to sit in the back and say, here's the 10 reasons why that'll never work. Instead of saying, here's the three reasons why we can try and make that happen. So be an innovator. It's so hard to be a chef. It's so easy to be a food critic. Go be a chef. Go make things. Go build things. Be innovative. Don't fall into the no trap, the negative trap. That's a, that's a, that's a terrible way to live in general. And it's a terrible way to innovate in a company. Keep it alive. And remember that the current and the future are still, still abundant. Despite everything going on, they're still abundant. We still have incredible technology around healthcare, communication, transportation. This will radically push the world forward in a way that nothing could have. This has pushed the adoption of digital tools like nothing I have ever seen in 40 years of life. We are in the middle of a radical transformation in the way people work. And uh, I'm excited to be part of it. I hope you are too. Uh, we, you know, this is Peter Diamandis' list of, of all the crazy things that he thinks are coming, like car ownership dying and human missions to Mars. A private company just launched astronauts into space. That just happened. SpaceX is launching tens of thousands of satellites right now to connect the entire globe in a multi-gigabit, ultra-high-speed broadband network. That, that's happening right now. I mean, Musk is launching rockets from the United States every month filled with satellites. He's got several hundred in space. Until now, the largest constellation uh, space telecommunication satellites was the Iridium network that had 66 satellites. That was it. He has several hundred now that he's going to be turning on for his solution. I mean, just absolutely incredible what is going on and what is coming. Also, if you have something to say, if you're at a construction company, if you could just take 15 minutes and go fill our survey out, we do a report every year. It's our ninth year of doing the, the construction technology report. We'd love to hear from you. 15 minutes on how you're using technology is at jbknowledge.com slash survey. 
Um, at this point, I'm going to open it up for Q and A. Um, Billy, if you're getting any on on that end, and I haven't seen them, you're welcome to read them, or you can release them to me. Um, if y'all have questions, I'd be happy to answer it and have some some good time for discussion. We have time in our in our schedule today. Okay, so. Um... Uh, let me let me start with this. Um, construction industry isn't always the early bird when it comes to technology, and that's probably why the trailblazers and uh, organizations or businesses that decide to 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 deploy or start using some, uh, you know, experience enormous success. But how how do you choose? out of all technology tools uh, that are available, the right one for the business. What is, uh, I suppose there is a few questions in this one. Uh, what is the, um, what is the, what is the right way to choose what is appropriate? Um, do you, uh, what are the options on a project specific? or what are the options on uh, you know on on the business level so yeah, yeah i got it so you're you, you it's a great question it's usually the first question i get every time i talk where do we start right where do we begin yeah. um we have a phrase in english that may or may not translate really well here low hanging fruit i always start with low hanging fruit what does that mean that means I don't start with the ERP system. I don't start out by going after the accounting system and changing that because that's literally the biggest project you could tackle. Um, I like walking around job sites and walking around offices and I like looking for Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> that's, that's, or paper. I mean, God help you if it's paper. Okay, if it's paper, that's an, that's an easy paper. Like if someone's doing a hand tabulation or they're filling out a report, like a daily report or a safety inspection, or if they're like, I'm like, okay, that can go now. That's low hanging fruit. It's easy. But let's say it's safety reports. I'll go to safe site and say, okay, use this mobile app, fill out all your safety reports here, stop using the paper. And, and you can get implementation fairly quickly. Uh, Digital you know, plans. This is another really great one. If if you're still using paper plans, like rolls of plans, that's an easy target because we can go on to plan grid or we can go on to, pro, you know, any one of a number. Bluebeam you can use. I mean, there's a lot of different apps you can use. Um, since you're a, a Kiwi, there's a there's an app out of uh, Australia, New Zealand called Bull Clip that does the same thing. You know. The, I, by the way, I've got an Australian solution for everything because they, 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 the <laughs> Aussies, the Aussies are constantly innovating on construction, and then they, their market is so small there that they immediately start selling in the United States. So on my podcast, we have a ton of Australians and, and Kiwis that come over to the states to sell their product. Yeah, a lot of innovation there, yeah, yeah, they, they, because they're very innovative, very very innovative people with a very small market, and so they they're they're, they're desperate to get to the United States. So it, it's uh, it's really, really interesting. I, I say start with the low-hanging fruit. Walk around your job sites. Look for paper in Excel. And then look for mobile apps uh, that can solve some of those problems, right? That's that's really where you can you can have some pretty big uh, some pretty big improvements. So I, I'd say that's where I'd start. Uh, you know, beyond that, you have to remember to, to, to watch out for tackling bigger projects, you know, because they can... The other thing I've seen very often, Billy, in uh, construction companies is uh, another thing we, we call paralysis by analysis. Analysis, they get, yes. They get so hung up in analyzing what is the exact best thing that they never adopt anything. They just never adopt anything, right? And so that's another really big problem. Um, if you can see that a solution delivers ROI in under a year, if it delivers return on investment in under a year, just adopt it. Don't even... Don't even worry. It's like it's like a lot of construction companies have a hang up about buying tablets or iPads. They're like, well, what if it goes outdated next year? Like, so what? Like, so what? Mm -hmm. I buy a I buy a new phone and, and a new iPad every year. This is disposable technology to me. 
and and it's it, because it delivers so much value that by the time the next one comes out, I've already gotten my money back. That's really mm-hmm. a, a, an interesting thing. I think it's hard for people to get their head around. Yeah, and uh, and so I suppose you know everything uh, as you mentioned earlier. You know, construction industry is a low margin industry, so we of all its own creation. All... of its own creation. We made it yes. that way. It's our fault. We made it. That <laughs> Self imposed. Yeah. So, uh, so how do you? Uh, I, I suppose you can improve the effectiveness uh, and productivity, but how? How do you demonstrate that that actually improves the bottom line? Yeah. Okay. It's 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 um, it's always the 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 proof the the what's in it for me syndrome that everyone in construction has. Uh, so first off. I'm a big fan of lean. Uh, mm-hmm. My favorite book on lean is called Two Second Lean by Paul Akers. And what he suggests is every time you make an improvement, take a video of what you did before and what you do after. And go mm-hmm. in and combine, combine the videos and store it in your company SharePoint or somewhere, a library of all the videos of all the improvements. So when somebody questions it, you can literally play the video and show them here's what the workers did before here's what they did after it took them five minutes before it takes them one minute now and that's when you can start working on productivity case studies because that's where you can say look there was a a drastic reduction in the amount of time and and you've got to get good at storytelling And, and billy that's the big the big problem a lot of people have is telling the story correctly so like, let's go back on the slides. I'm going to reshare my screen here, and I mm-hmm. want you to look. At, I want you to look at how Ryan Hoggett did this because he did a really incredible job of showing, and you should be able to see. This is Ryan Hoggett telling the story of using Stratus software and TigerStop uh, to do spooling. It was 10 minutes per sheet. Now it's one minute per spool, before and after. So he did before and after productivity ma- measurement, cast iron cutting, and before before implementing Tiger Stop, the hardware, and Stratus, the software, it was 100 feet per hour of cast iron cutting, now it's 500 feet an hour. It was 150 feet an hour of copper PVC cutting, now it's 750 feet an hour. It was one to four hours per package to create cut list, now it's one minute per package using Stratus. Mm-hmm. So you first have to document and this is the this is the slightly painful part. You first have to document how it was done before, and then you document how it's done now, and then you take a video. Uh, and, and it was interesting, even with all this documentation, the CEO of UMC, the first day that all that went live, you know what he did? He walked out on the pre, on the shop floor and he started yelling at everybody to get back to work because it was 1030 in the morning and they were standing around and he thought that they were slacking off. So he walked around, get back to work, get back to work, blah, 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 blah. And they, they said, sir, we finished all the day's work already. Like, what do you mean? It t- 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 took you eight hours before. Yes, sir, it takes two and a half hours now to do the work. So even, even with the case study and the videos, he didn't believe it until he went on the shop floor and he saw it, that what used to take his crew eight hours a day now took two and a half. And so you have to get good at telling the ROI case story. You have to get good at telling the story of how this is transformational, how much time it cuts down. And that, and, and really the, the big one, the big money savings in construction where we bury buckets of gold every day on the job site is preventable mistakes. Production rate, improving production rates will dramatically, it can double your profit margins. It can take you from 5% margins to 10 as a subcontract, take you from two to three to eight as a general contractor. I mean, improving production rates is a big deal. But when you're when you're getting, the really interesting thing is when you improve productivity, you're also improving accuracy. As a general rule of thumb, you're implementing technologies that improve the accuracy of the build. And so if you don't have to cut that beam out and then put a new one in, that, that yeah. that's a, that's a $50,000 mistake, right? Like if you have to cut a beam out because you, you you didn't clash detect your model and you've got a you've got a plumbing pipe running through a load bearing steel beam. You've never seen that though, right? Construction. 
I mean, they make mistakes all the time. And so cutting out that beam is a big problem. Doing it digitally is not. And so the, the dollar savings and preventable mistakes is a lot harder to tell that story because, you know, the owner will say, well, we would have caught that. No, no, you wouldn't have had. Let's let's go back to the last. So hopefully you're keeping good detailed project records where you can go backwards. You can say, look, we made a million dollars a project of mistakes for the last five projects. Here, here's all the we had because you do track re rework, right? Mm -hmm. So here we we went from eight hundred thousand dollars of rework per job. Now we're at two hundred thousand. <laughs> you know, that's you know the the rework tracking is really important. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, um... You know, when you when you showed the sort of uh, now the the sort of available tools to do the uh, daily as builds and yeah. uh, uh, daily monitoring of of uh, productivity and progress on site, I suppose that's uh, that's a very valuable uh, tool for a client because currently they rely on uh, you know on the reports that we type write uh, pictures that to a degree can be uh, sort of presented a lot better than it actually is so i suppose uh, you know from client's perspective it enables them to 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 in a, in a in a real time to see the see the progress and there is, uh, you know, it's accurate. It um, uh, speaks for itself. Uh, and I suppose, um, you know, it's a, a lot more informative. Uh, and it makes the whole process a lot more transparent. You know, yeah. depends on the occasion whether or not it's for better or worse. And but that, and uh, then, yeah, you just hit on the head. Some people don't want transparency, right? They don't want that. I mean, that's. I, I think as a as a builder as a contractor you have to desire transparency. Um, you know, you you, you hopefully are okay with giving that mm -hmm. level of insight to your client, uh, and hopefully you have a good relationship with the client so that they don't punish you for being transparent with them. I mean, there's a we have some we have some deep cultural problems in construction around trust. We have a low trust industry. Um, a lot of people cover up mistakes and they cover up problems. And they don't like talking about them. And, and these technology, here's the, here's the thing. Owners are getting far more sophisticated. I mean, they're getting mm -hmm. far more sophisticated. Yeah. Yeah. Owner, owner, owners, they're, they're taking project managers at the large contractors and they're hiring them in-house to be owner's reps and to oversee the jobs. So they know all the tricks everybody plays. So the, yeah. owners are get, the owners are getting far more sophisticated and they're starting to put so do you want to put cameras on your job site connected to an artificial intelligence algorithm that's doing this? Do you want to do that before or after your client does it for you? Because <laughs> we're starting yeah. to see really sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, like Google and Facebook are building all over the world. They're building data centers all over the world. They're putting cameras on their job sites. They're directly supervising their GCs and subs. So do you want to find out the mistakes before or after your client does? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah. Don't don't like, don't like, lag don't lag your clients in sophistication. That's like a general business rule. If your clients are more sophisticated than you, you've got a problem. You have a mm -hmm. big problem. It, you, can never, you can never win that that game. No, no, you cannot win that game. You will you will not you will not have a chance against a, a client that has more sophisticated than you. You, mm. you must must you you must maintain technological parity or superiority to your customers you must it's it's like it's not mm -hmm. i cannot have a situation as a service provider i have 212 people we cannot have a situation where we are less sophisticated than our own customers <laughs> yeah. it is yeah. it is it is really bad for business for your customers to be more sophisticated than you technologically <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's happening right now. <laughs> it's happening. Yeah. I mean, by virtue of that, you you are definitely providing a good service. You are providing the client with all the information they require, transparency, and then if they have systems to to double check or you know to run them in parallel, you know it's only it's only for the better again. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and uh, in terms of um, you know selecting selecting the technology tools and how comparable they are, 
um, you know, if you select uh, one thing for monitoring, um, another thing for uh, data collection, how do you ensure that they actually they work together? Well, you know, that's a that's a, a more complex topic. Integration is something that I've spent the last 15 years working on. Um, I helped co-found an organization that was dedicated to getting technology companies to integrate with each other mm -hmm. and to developing a set of open standards. So when you're adopting low hanging fruit, often you don't have the luxury of everything working together. You're still making a lot more money <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. because you know anything's better than paper in Excel. I mean, just about anything is better than paper in Excel. But certainly we take a really hard look at when we're, when we're doing, um, when we're doing adoption, we look at that partner's ecosystem. So like Procore has an app marketplace. Autodesk uh, BIM 360 has an, has an app marketplace. I mean, all the major, all the major big solution providers have integration partnership marketplaces where you can literally do your shopping there. You can say, okay, mm -hmm. uh, this, you know, my solution, my prime solution, my primary product of record uh, is, let's say it's Procore, and it works with these eight different software companies. And I can pick from there and have, have a certainty that they're connected to the Procore gateway to exchange. Mm -hmm. So one way to do your shopping for technology products is to pick the solutions you already have that you really love, whatever it is, and go and pick through their marketplace and see who they're already integrated with. And I, I, I do that because for CRM, we use HubSpot for CRM and we love HubSpot. You know, for, for marketing business to business, HubSpot is about as good as it gets. I like it more than Salesforce. And so when I'm looking for a product that I want to use in addition to HubSpot, I go into HubSpot's integration marketplace and I look through and they have hundreds of solutions there that I can look through and say, okay, I like that one, that one, that one, and that one. Let's go ahead and tie those in. That's a fairly uh, simple process. If, if those connections don't exist, the likelihood is you're going to have to do Excel export and Excel import to integrate data between solutions. Sure. The number, we have a nine-year survey that I mentioned just a minute, a minute ago. The number one way people in construction exchange data between their solutions right now is by exporting and importing Excel spreadsheets. And, and that's not a great way of doing it, but it's still better than being on paper and Excel as your primary product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and again, you said, you know, how to start and where to start from, and uh, it's the easiest way from so logging your fruit. But um, if you wanted to develop a strategy, you know, and, 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 the, and the plan, uh, sort of start with something and then end up with with a certain uh, you know ability yeah what is the help that is available in the market because i mean um you know construction industry is um in many ways you know uh, we mix the concrete the same way as we did you know 200 years ago yeah. um it's sure. still still the same so yeah and, and, yeah, and we yeah, what resources are available to help people? I mean, we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we built an entire consulting division dedicated to that, uh, for mm -hmm. sure. So we have an entire group of people that just help people set strategy budgets, um, targets, and deadlines. You know, that's uh, something that we we have we have spent a, a lot of time on. Um, and so we bring people in and have them fill out what we call our construction technology health checkup that at least mm -hmm. looks at all the different categories of software where we're looking at, you know, their BIM and VDC department. We look at their ERP system, look at project and field operations. We looked at pre-construction and estimating, you know, and we look at, you know, accounting and finance. We'll look at, we, we go through and look at all the major categories of, of operations they have and then all the technology they're currently using uh, and then we, we try to seek out and find uh, Excel spreadsheets and paper pretty quickly. And then we look for the, oh, there's just so many hacked solutions in construction that we just try and find, right? We spend a lot of time trying to find those. 
but that's that's really what it, what it involves. Is we we develop typically a three to five year roadmap depending on the company, and we mm -hmm. put it in. You know, here's your phase one items, the low hanging fruit. Phase two items, the medium sized targets, and phase three items. That's your your long range objectives. That phase three is always stuff like reevaluate ERP if they're not on a good ERP. Like if you're on Sage, we're gonna probably tell you to reevaluate your ERP because mm -hmm. say 100 and 300 are antiquated, outdated products that are not being maintained properly. So, you know, we, we have pretty strong opinions about certain solutions, but, but yeah, it, you know, it, look, it's always good to have a strategic roadmap. It's just not good to let your, your strategic roadmap process take over your, you're doing something your, now. Yeah, your ability to do some things now that can that can deliver quick return. So I think you have to have a good healthy mix of let's go get some things done attitude and let's develop a proper strategic plan. <laughs> you know, because yeah. the, you can't be on you can't be on like entirely one side or the other. You have to meet in the middle. You have to be in the reasonable middle. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in terms of uh, communication, um, and I suppose it, it depends on the on the level of uh, you know what what part of the of the operations relies on technology tools. Um, but how is that in your experience? How how does that help to um, uh, help to communicate within the team with the stakeholders? How does technology help with communicating inside of a team? Well, does, does it sort of isolate people or? Yeah, it, look, if it's done right, it it, it, uh, let, let's just take one example, because in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll pick one example, right? Email versus Teams or Slack, all right? Let's just talk about using Microsoft Teams, which is a a chat, a group chat tool that can integrate with Microsoft Office 365 and SharePoint. It's a really, really great tool. If you use Word and Outlook, you probably have access to Teams. Um, great technology. It's dramatically reduced the amount of email that we have to send each other. I, I don't send company-wide emails anymore. I, I go on Teams and I post onto a channel. And, and so Teams has helped brought a, it has helped to bring us together. Zoom. Right. We now we we use Teams, but Teams has not done a great job supporting multi-party video chat. And I mean like 50 at a time, 150 videos at a time. We do a company quarterly presentation where I present to my whole company, all 212 people, every 90 days. We do that now all on Zoom, where they all log in from their house on their computer, and I can see all 212 videos at one time. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It brings us together. So you know if you have rules around how you use the technology like we require that you have video on in a meeting so we require video on because we don't have face-to-face -face meetings right now and not for the foreseeable yeah. future we, yeah. require, <laughs> we, yeah, we require video on voice chat on you're not allowed to touch your computer or check email while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. and that so if you have the right rules around your meetings and you use tools the right way like Teams and Zoom, or, or go to meeting, you, it results in a in a um, in a technology that actually brings people together and helps them chat. You know, I, we have a very active company chat now where we we can all chat with each other on Teams, and it's really helped us uh, get to know each other better. So there's there's some really neat yeah. things uh, that go on there. Uh, so yeah, let me Can't let me share. Just... Let, let me share uh -huh. Let me share the last uh, slide here. Uh, you should be able to see it. Mm -hmm. If you want to check out our podcast, you can go uh, to the Content Crew on any podcast app. Just type in the Content Crew. Um, if you want to check out our consulting services, we we help companies with this. You can you can you can check all of these things out by going to jbknowledge.com/slash/james. Um, mm -hmm. The texting won't work from Qatar. I'm sorry, I left that on there because that's not going to work from uh, abroad, but just go to jbknowledge.com slash James, fill a quick form out. You can download these slides there and you can also, you can go through and check everything out that I talked about with the podcast and consulting and all of our products. You can also email me at james at jbknowledge.com. Great. Okay, so we come to the stage where uh, I wish to thank you, James, for, for this insightful 
uh, captivating and engaging uh, presentation. Um, thank you so much for giving us your expertise and time and for sharing this with us. Uh, I hope we will have you in Qatar once when all these restrictions are gone away and we start traveling um, and then we can do it um, and person. then we can do it in person. Yes, and uh, uh, and also, you know, for for you to get this sort of uh, uh, the 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 hands-on feeling of of uh, Qatar market. Yes. So um, I think our next slide is about um, uh, this is the uh, next month we will have uh, NEWIC leadership series where we will have Rebecca Morris uh, presenting to us three sessions, inclusion, team performance and resilience. So, um, so we we'll look forward to have you all there again. Um, uh, James, was there anything else you wanted to, to say? No, that's all. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me today. Uh, a, a big hello. Uh, it was from, our excellent pleasure. Yeah, from, from America. And I, I, I look forward to the day when I can travel to Qatar and, and see your beautiful country. Yeah, um, I have to tell you, uh, as uh, you mentioned your podcast, um, a, po a couple of podcasts uh, um, to me uh, with uh, Nadine, um, a lady who is working for Turner Construction. So I've listened to that one. So and some great material in your podcast. So I would highly recommend it for everybody who wants to stay up to date. Uh, you know, worldwide information on uh, on uh, activities in construction. It's very informative. It's kind of like you know, on one place you you find a lot of information and uh, a lot of insights. So um, I'd highly recommend that. And uh, I have sub subscribed um, <laughs> to it. So thank you, thank you again, James. Thank you to all of our audience uh, for the time this evening. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, we'll see you all next time. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.